I want to say, first off, they are, uh, I was hoping to get them before they walked off the stage, but that was our youth band, everyone. Yeah, can we thank them? Yeah. It's, I'm always so encouraged to see our youth band up leading us in worship and us giving us that, them that opportunity to lead us. They do such a great job. Appreciate that. Uh, my name is Mark, uh, pastor of discipleship and compassion here at Harbor. And uh, just like Isaiah, who was up here earlier, my family and I, we've just been loving watching the Olympics. Uh, show of hands. Are you guys watching Olympics? I see some hands. Some of you are like, we don't even care. <laughs> but just love watching the Olympics. Uh, I think it was the opening weekend. My family and I were sitting there watching the men's triathlon. Now, I don't know much about the men's triathlon, and I can't begin to imagine how hard it is. But we we're watching this one guy came off the swim on his bike, and he got a sizable lead in front of everyone else. I mean, he was taking some turns, and no one was else was around them, around him. Came to transition to the running portion, started running, it was doing well, but then over the kilometers, the pack closed in on him, and slowly, uh, someone passed him, and then another person passed him, and another person passed him, and, 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 and it made me think, this is probably not how the guy planned this out, or what he was hoping for. Uh, it made me think back to, to my grade five, or four, or six, somewhere in there in Toronto, running track, and uh, I remember getting ready for the 400, that's once around the track, and, and uh, just imagine with me, an a, a 11 or 12 year old little Mark lining up on the line, and, and, and the gun goes, and I just burst off, and I mean, this is not a sprint, but I'm sprinting, <laughs> and, and, and you should have seen me, the form, the, just the finesse, and the grace, um, and then I got to about halfway around the track, and, and that's when my side started killing me, where I was panting, and couldn't breathe, and then slowly, and surely someone passed me, then another person passed me, and another person passed me, and I'll stop there. But no one wants to slow down in a race, right? As we think of that, we all want to finish well. And, and I wonder if you'll track with me, get it, track with me, um, if I can move that over into our faith life, that we want to finish well as we live for Jesus, as we, as we live out our faith and seek to follow him. And, and what I thought this morning, I was just thinking of different age groups. Maybe you're a teenager here, you're sitting here and you're thinking, you're talking to me about finishing well? Like, I'm a teenager. I, 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 I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking just how do I begin? But I think it's so important for you, if you're a teenager, for you to think about, okay, how do I start this race? How do I initiate this race and foundation that I need so that years down the road, I'm going to finish well? Uh, maybe you're sitting here and you're a young adult, and I love that stage of life. I still think sometimes like I'm, I'm a young adult, but I'm not. Uh, but that stage of life is great, right? You're, you're ready to seize life. You're ready to grab a hold of it, and you're passionate, and you want to change the world. And, and, and what I would say to you is, what foundation could you start now and create and develop so that you will finish well years down the road? Let's move on to the kind of the next age group. I'm not going to say ages now. <laughs> I'm just going to say in, the, in those years where you're, you might be just swamped with family and work and caring for a house and paying the bills and watching over the COVID puppy and all this stuff that's happening and your life is just busy and it's hard to, to, to keep your sight on how do you finish well. You're just trying to survive each day, let alone finishing well. And then, and then maybe if we go to the, let's just say, the more mature people, um, and you are, maybe you're still working, or maybe you're retired, and maybe you're still, you're, uh, actually, when I talk to retired people, you seem busier than just as you were yeah, earlier years. And maybe you're busy with grandkids, or busy with traveling, or maybe you're facing a health circumstance. And, and, and how do you think about, okay, how do I finish? well. It's so important for us to ask these questions regardless of where you are on the age spectrum because I think if we're honest with ourselves, running the race is not easy. Running the race is not easy. Finishing well is not easy. It's not something that just happens as if we kind of just step day to day and, and we're going to finish well regardless. We can't just sit back and hope it happens. It requires us to be intentional to put priorities and in, in, in make everyday decisions and, and not sure about you, but it's so easy to slip, isn't it? It's so easy to, to let our eyes shift off of Jesus, to kind of maybe plateau, to settle a bit, to, to settle on other things or to rely on other things. And so this morning we want to ask the question, how will we finish? 
will we finish well? Or how do we finish well? These are good questions for us to ponder. And as we ask these questions, we're looking in on King Asa's life. Uh, we're in the middle of a series right now called The Kings. And uh, what we're doing is we're working and looking at various kings in, in, uh, in Israel's history. Uh, we're not doing it in sequential order. We're just looking at king and king kind of jumping all over the place. But what we're doing is we're seeking to learn from these kings, but also to see the faithfulness of God in the often checkered lives of these faulty kings. And so I invite you to open up your Bibles and join with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 14, or turn on your Bible, 2 Chronicles chapter 14, and uh, King Asa's reign la uh, is recorded for three chapters, 14, 15, 16. Uh, it's all right, I'm not going to read the whole thing, I'm going to kind of jump and walk us through the story and highlight various passages. So have your Bible open and ready to follow along with me, and my hope for this morning is simply to walk through his life, to share about how he, how he journeyed, uh, but also at the end then to, to, to provide for us four takeaways that we can take with us this morning as we consider Asa's reign in his life. And so our desire as we look in his reign is how we, to ponder how do we finish well. So starting off in 2 Chronicles 14, we're introduced to Asa, and uh, what we read first in verse 2 is his legacy statement. Now we read this statement for every king. The author tells us, okay, is this a king who is good and does what's right in the eyes of the Lord or not? And so what's the legacy statement? What's the summary of Asa? Verse 2, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. R right off the start, we know that Asa is a good, was a good king. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And we see that right off the bat in verse 3, because we see how he starts his reign. Verse 3, he does, actually, he does three significant things here in the next number of verses. Uh, follow along verse 3. He removed the foreign altars in high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. He built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. Then jump down to the end of verse 7. So they built and prospered. And so we look at, we're just setting the stage here, and Asa starts off, he is a good king. He does three things, right? He removes the places and the objects of idol worship. He rids the land of, of worship other than to God. He, he commands the people to seek the Lord. In other words, he, he led the people to look to, to God, to worship him, and to serve him. And then thirdly, he built up the kingdom. He strengthened the kingdom. He strengthened the cities. This was a good king. He sought to lead his people, lead God's people in worship of God. And so what this does is it sets the stage for us this morning. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. He's, he sets up this good foundation. And then what we have for the next two chapters is what we're going to see is two portions of his reign. So we're going to see the early portion of his reign. And then there's actually a 20-year gap that we're, we don't hear anything about. And then there's the final years of his reign. So we're going to see the, an early portion of his reign, and then the final portion of his reign. And, and what's so fascinating as we look into this passage is that for both of those periods, we see him facing the same two circumstances. So both in the early and the later stages, he faces an attacking army. And then in both the early and the later, he faces a message or receives a message from God. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at those circumstances, and then we're going to see how does King Asa finish, and how do we finish well. So start off, it's in the early part of his reign, an army comes and starts to attack them. And that's verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 15. Oh, sorry, no it's not. That is, oh, where did my page go? Oh, sorry, here's, yeah, so here is the first invading army, that's verse 9. I just skipped ahead, don't want to miss this part. <laughs> verse 9, Zer Zerea, uh, the Cushite, marched out against them with an army, listen to this, of thousands upon thousands and 300 chariots and came as far as uh, Maresha. Uh, Asa went out to meet him. So here comes an army against Asa and Judah, okay? And, and did you get the size? 
thousands upon thousands, which in, in other words, this is like almost uncountable. It's the, the estimate is probably a million man strong army. A million man strong army is coming towards Asa, towards Judah, and I can imagine just like the ground shaking as these soldiers march towards battle, towards attacking. Uh, you might wonder, okay, well, what's Asa's army? If you bump back a bit to verse 8, Asa had an army of 300,000 men from Judah, equipped with large shields and spears, and 280,000 from Benjamin, armed with small shields and with bows. All these were brave fighting men. And you look, hey, that's not too bad. I mean, they got, he's got some brave men. He's got, what's that, just under 600,000. They might not be as well equipped. It looks like a decent size army, but they're totally outnumbered. And there they are. They're standing on the battle lines. And I, I imagine in my head the two armies are facing one another with a gap between them. And, and I can imagine Asa sitting there with his army, his good army, brave army, but knowing that he is well outnumbered. This does not look good. I can imagine his heart beating hard, and I can imagine him being overwhelmed by the circumstance that's sitting right there in front of him. And we wonder, okay, Asa, what do you do? What do you do in a situation like this? Verse 11 then Asa, call, Asa called to the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. Don't you love that? I love that. Ace is there, and, and he realizes his position. He sees the enemy. He sees the obstacle in front of us, the difficulty that he's facing. He realized his own weakness, but there was more. He realized not only who God was, but he realized the power of God. He knew that he was helpless, but with God, it was a totally different story. And so he called out to the Lord, Lord, you are powerful. There is no one like you. Help us, Lord. We rely on you. And so what I love is Asa's focus was not on the army that stood out in front of him. It wasn't the million man army that were looking him down across the field. No, his eyes were on the Lord. His eyes were on God and he calls out to God. He makes the decision not to rely on his own strength. He makes the decision not to rely on his good men. Although he had good men, he chose to rely on God and turned to him in prayer and pled out to God for help. The result we see in verse 12, the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled, and Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. Such a great number of Cushites fell that they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. The men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. Victory. But, but as you look at that victory, who brought the victory? Who brought the victory? Uh, was it Asa and Judah who secured the victory? Well, yes and no. Asa and Judah were the ones who charged out and fought, but we realize that they didn't bring the victory. The Lord brought the victory. Look at the very beginning of verse 12. The Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. And what we see here in the face of insurmountable odds, God led his people to victory. Love that. Here's the first story. King Asa faces an army, faces a horrible situation, a, a difficult situation, relies on God, and God brings him victory. Now we look to the message of God in this early part of the reign. So the, uh, they're coming back from the win, from the victory, and in, ver in chapter 15, verse 1, this is where, what we read. Uh, the Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, listen to me. Asa and all of Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without true, the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he, found, and he was found by them. Down to verse 7. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. We, that's a lot written there, but what God is saying through Azariah is essentially reminding them of their covenant relationship with God. 
of the commitment that they have with God, that if you obey the terms of this commitment, then you will be blessed. If you, if you turn away or if you uh, do not follow through the terms of this commitment, then things will not go well for you. You will not receive the blessing from God. And so what God was doing in communicating this was he was calling them to continue on in seeking after him. I mean, think of it. They've just come back from a victory. And what do we all kind of do when we come back from a victory? We kind of puff ourselves up, right? Look at us. Look how good we did. We just won. We just beat that million-person army. Look at us. We're so great. And what God is saying is that, remember, remember, we're in a relationship here. If you continue to seek me, I'm going to bless you. If you turn away from me, then you're not going to receive my blessing. And so he reminds them, hey, we're in this covenant relationship together, Israel. Keep looking to me. And so how did Asa respond to this reminder that they were in a relationship together, Judah and God? Verse 8, we read this. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded, the prophet, he took courage he removed the detestable idols from whole, the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repl- repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Uh, Asa responds so well to God's message. Uh, previously, it was said that he removed the idols from Judah. Do you remember that? But now when he hears this call to keep going, keep relying on me, Asa, what does he do? He expands that. He removes the idol worship from not only uh, the Judah from before, but also Benjamin and also from all the towns that they had kind of taken control over. The whole land, he removed the idol worship. And not only that, he repaired the altar of the Lord. He heard God's message realized that it was God who brought victory, and kind of doubled his efforts, pushed on on his efforts to continue to rely on God, seeking him more than he did before. And and, and there's even more. Verse 9, he gathers the people in the midst of this. Then he assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people of Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon who had settled among them, for large numbers had come over to them from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. They assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. At that time, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder that they had brought back. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart. Down to 15, all Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and he was found by them, so the Lord gave them rest on every side. In response to this warning of God of, hey, don't cool off. I know he won, but don't cool off. Keep on relying on me. Asa not only removed the places of idol, he he repaired the altar. He also led his people into covenant with God, affirmed that covenant, and they entered it wholeheartedly, fully committed to the Lord. And in verse 17, we read this statement, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord, all of his life. And here we get a picture of the early portion of Asa's reign. He's a good king. He's a good king. He's a good foundation. He's relied on God in the face of difficulty. He's increased his efforts to rely on God and keep his focus on God. And there we see the first portion of Asa's reign. Now, 20 years, we come to the final portion of his reign. Did Asa finish well? Did he finish well? So first of all, remember, he faced an attacking army. Here comes an attacking army again. Chapter 16. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, Basha, uh, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asa, king of Judah. Uh, Here, the northern army, so at this point, the kingdom of God, the people of God are split into two. There's a northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah. And here, the northern kingdom is coming against uh, uh, Judah, coming against a city there. And, and, and how does Asa respond to this army that's coming into their land, trying to take over? Verse 2, Asa then took the silver and the gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace and sent it to Ben-Hadid, king of Aram, who is ruling in Damascus, let there be a treaty between me and you. Wait a second here. 
In the early years, here's he's facing a million-person army, and what does he do? He turns to God, relies on God, and trusts in God. But here we see a totally different response. He, he knew he needed the Lord to protect him, to fight for him, to protect his land. But what did he do? He turned to a foreign nation. He turned to a foreign nation and created this political alliance, this political relationship to save himself. And what makes it even worse is that not only does he turn away from God and not rely on God, but what makes it worse is he takes money and, and resources from the temple. He takes God's resources, kind of turns away from God, and throws the resources at some foreign nation to say, hey, we need to create a treaty so that you'll back me up and they'll retreat and, and let's do this. And that's exactly what happened. They, uh, the king of Aram agreed. They attacked uh, a bunch of the towns in Israel, and when Basha, the king of Israel, heard this, he and his troops backed off, and they stopped attacking Judah. And what we see here is a totally different response than in his early years. We see a change here happen. We, we don't, not sure why, but we see a change. He didn't rely on God. He didn't turn to God, and uh, not a good intention of finishing well. Not a good intention. So when he faces his second army, not so good. He doesn't rely on God. He, he seeks man's power, strength around him to try to save himself. And, and so wait a sec. Let's now look at the message. Remember, there's a message of God now coming. How is he going to respond to this message? Will he, will he renew his vigor to seek the Lord? Will he, he respond well? Will he repent of not relying on God? Verse 7. This is the message from God in the later part of his reign. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. Were not the Cushites and the Libyans a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord ranged throughout the earth, to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. And God comes to Asa through Hanani and speaks these words, rebuking him for turning to political alliance and people instead of relying on him, that he had done this foolish thing. And we wonder, okay, Asa, are you going to realize it? Are you going to realize that you've lost sight of God? Are you going to take this rebuke? Are you going to turn from it, repent, uh, apologize, turn back to God? How are you going to respond? Asa, come on, respond well here, Asa. Verse 10, Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was so enraged that he put him in prison. At the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. Not looking good for Asa. He's deteriorating here. Asa was not responsive at all to the rebuke. He became enraged through Hananiah in prison and, and started to brutally oppress his people. He was becoming a stubborn old man, resistant to any rebuke, resistant to relying on God. And there's more. Listen to this, verse 22, skip down to 22. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, listen to this, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord but only from the physicians. Not only did he not seek the Lord's help in the midst of that northern army coming, not only did he not receive the rebuke and, and receive it and, and turn back to God, here he totally doesn't even look to God when, his, when he's having this severe health issue. I, I came across a sermon title uh, as I was preparing for this message, uh, a sermon title for King Asa, and it was this, Grumpy Old Men. <laughs> and, and this is it. Asa's a grumpy old man who'd lost sight of God, lost sight of relying on God. But there's more there. It's not just grumpiness here. This is, this is choosing not to rely on God, of losing sight of God. And it's tragic, really, with such a great start. Uh, he, he led the people well. He set up a kingdom that led the people well to serve and worship God. And yet we see him here stumbling in his old age. And he started to see story. He stopped relying on the Lord. And so what I want to do now is we want to pull away from the story. And there are four things that I want to kind of draw to our attention, get us to think about. And, and, and those four things are basically taken from the, the seer's words, Hananiah's words. And uh, there are four things that I see in there as God speaks to Asa, kind of showing him, and we see how he went wrong, but also how we finish strong. And the first takeaway is this. 
that we would re recognize the lure to look elsewhere. That we would recognize the lure to look elsewhere. In verse 7, what's the seer say? You, you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord. And here's Asa succumbed to that lure. I mean, there's that temptation. Here, here he's facing a difficulty, and he's like, okay, who's going to help me? And, and he looks around him, and, and what does he do? He gets tempted to say, oh, man, that nation is strong. Th that would be a great people to al align myself with, and, and I'm going to align with them. It was, the temptation was there. And, and what was more, when he was sick and his feet weren't doing so well, there was no thought of God. No thought of God. And he, he only looked to the doctors. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go to our doctors. <laughs> Hear me right. I'm not saying don't go to doctors. I'm not saying don't listen to your doctors, uh, their, their diagnosis, their treatment. That's all good stuff. That's good blessing that God's given us. I'm not saying that we don't have people in our lives that help us, that strengthen us, that walk with us, that encourage us. We absolutely need that. And people, God has brought people into our lives. It's a great blessing in, in our lives. And we realize that we can't do life alone. We can't. And that's why we do groups here at Harbor. That's why we need people in our lives where we commit to one another and walk with one another and help each other grow as disciples of Jesus and looking forward to start more of those groups this fall. But, but we need people. It's, I'm not saying that we don't need people, but the problem comes, the problem comes when, we re, when all we rely on are other things or other things people, when God doesn't even enter into our minds, when we don't seek him, when he is an afterthought, that's the problem. That's the problem. And there's always that lure to look somewhere else first than to look to God first. Uh, go back to the early part of his reign. I love what Asa did, right? There he is facing that massive army. And what was his response? He went to the Lord in prayer. He called upon the Lord. And that, Harbor, should be our first response. When we're running into trouble, when we're running into difficulty, when we're unsure what we might do, whether it be a relational or health or financial, what's our response? First, we go to the Lord. We call on him. We ask him for help. We ask him for wisdom. And that we would realize, okay, before I look elsewhere, Lord, I come to you. Would you help me? Would you give me wisdom? Who is in my life that you can help me, that can come along and help me? So first of all is looking to him first, realizing or recognizing the lure to look elsewhere. Secondly, remember how God has worked in the past. And that's what Asa didn't do. Verse 8, were not the Cushites a mighty army, yet you relied on the Lord and he delivered you into your hand? In other words, God says, did you not remember <laughs> Did you not remember when I brought victory to you, to that million-person army standing in front of you? How would you forget that? How would you forget that? It's such a good reminder that we need to remember how God has worked on our behalf. Because so easily we forget that, don't we? In the midst of a difficult circumstance, it's so easy for us just to see the problem right in front of us. And that's all we see. And it's so difficult sometimes for us to look back and realize, wow, God, look at the way that you've worked in my life. Look at the way you've helped me. Look at the way you encouraged me in that situation. How you helped my family. How you helped our church. It's so important to remember how God has worked in the past. Uh, I came across Psalm 77, 11 and 12. It says this, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. And when we do this, when we pause in the middle of difficulty and remember who God has been in the past, it changes our perspective. We see things differently. We realize that God is bigger than what we face in front of us, that God has the power to help us when we look back and see what God has done. And so let me ask you, how has God worked in the past in your life? Think for a moment right now. How has God worked in your life? How has he strengthened you? How has he helped you? How has he given his grace to you in the midst of previous difficult times? And how has he been faithful in the midst of that? As I look into Isa's situation, Isa, Asa, sorry, Isa, if you're here. I'm talking about Asa. As I look into Asa's situation, I'm like, all he had was victory over a million Pearson army. I mean, that is really nothing compared to what we as believers have to look back on. I mean, he looked back on a defeat of a million-person army. We as Christians able to look back to the cross, where Jesus hung on that cross and faced the ultimate enemy, 
He faced sin and death, and Jesus was victorious on our behalf. And through Jesus, we have life. We have victory. Asa just had a million-person army coming after him. We had the cross. We have the cross to look back at. We have other situations that God has worked in our lives. And so we remember what God has done for us, his power and his might. We then see what's in front of us differently. Third is this, realize that God is eager to help. Realize that God is eager to help. Uh, verse 9, there's this description, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen. I love that. Not only do we see the sovereignty of God, that, that he sees all and knows all, but we also see his heart, his desire to help and to strengthen us. He, he's actually waiting there. He's, he's, he's like sitting on the sidelines. He's like, I'm ready to jump in here, buddy. I'm ready. Turn to me and I'm ready to jump in. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought of that image of God in your mind that God is eager and ready to help you? That he's just sitting there. He's not passive over on the sidelines, sitting, eating a hot dog off in the stands. No, he's on the sidelines, ready to jump in. He's interested in you. He sees what you're facing, and he's all ready to jump in. He's eager to help. Would you look to him? Would you turn to him? Uh, what I find so important in this description is the eyes of the Lord range uh, throughout the earth to strengthen. Sometimes we think uh, we'd like to see it say to remove our difficulty. The eyes of the Lord range to the earth to remove the problem, remove the situation. But no, no, no. We see to, to give strength, to strengthen. See, following Jesus, following God does not mean a life is going to be easy or turn out easy. In fact, it probably will end up being harder. <laughs> and, and so what we see here is not the idea that life is easy, but that the good news that God is eager to help. He is eager to give us his strength so that we can continue to move forward and continue to live a life of faith following him, regardless of how the situation may play out. He gives us the strength to continue to walk and to walk through that. Realize that God is eager to help. And lastly is this, uh, resolve to be fully committed to him. Resolve to be fully committed to him. At the end of verse 9, what does it say? He will strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And the idea is there is wholeheartedly. It's, it's complete. There's, there's no part that's left out. This is not a partial commitment. <laughs> this is not a, hey, God, I'm going to follow you, but you know, this area of my life or, or this portion of my life, you know, that's kind of off bounds. The rest of me, God, you got me. I'm committed to you. That's not that. That's not, that's not hey, God, I'm going to commit my Sunday to you, you know, it's going to be a good day. I'm going to come and sing some songs and hear from teaching. But the rest of the week, God, you know what? I'm committed to other things. I'm committed to the things that I want to do. No, no, no. What God is saying is that he's out to strengthen those who are fully committed to him, who are turning to him, to pressing towards him and seeking to rely on him. And so I want to get you to think about this for a second. How would you assess your heart commitment to the Lord this morning? Uh, don't worry, you're not going to have to share it with your partner or your spouse or your friend. But if you were to rate your level of commitment to the Lord this morning, you look maybe over the last week, did you rely on him in the face of difficulty? Did you quickly turn to him in prayer? Did you seek to live in obedience to him and his word? Were you active in putting to death sin in your life and choosing obedience regardless of how difficult that was? Not sure about you. But even as I ask those questions of myself, it's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? Because we're, if we're honest with ourselves, we realize that our hearts aren't fully committed to the Lord. There are times in our lives when we err, when we fall, when we fail, and we wonder as we look at this, this word from God, we wonder, okay, then do we not receive the strength from the Lord? If we're not fully committed, because I mean, Look at my week I just had. There have been times when I wasn't fully committed. Does that mean I don't get your strength, God? Is, is, is there no hope left for me? Are we doomed? Do we fall short? Or are we not going to finish well? And this is where we see the good news and the beauty of the gospel. This is where we see the gospel. Because without Jesus, we would have no hope. We would have no hope. But Jesus did what we could not do. He is the only one who is faithful to the Father. He is the one who fulfilled the obligations of the covenant. And Jesus is the one, listen to this, Jesus is the one 
who earns the blessings of the covenant for all who believe and trust in him. Let me say that again. Jesus is the one who earns the blessings of the covenant for all who believe and trust in him. It's through Jesus, his life fully committed to the Father, that, that we receive the strength and an ongoing strength from the, from the Lord. How did Jesus do it? We took our place on the cross. He took our sin upon himself and gave us his righteousness. There are two passages that I'm going to put on the, on the screen for you. And, and I, I mean, I could have picked from numerous different passages, but there's just two passages I want to draw to our attention. And you're going to see them on the screen. The first is 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made him Jesus. God made Jesus who had no sin. Jesus was perfect. He was wholeheartedly obedient to God. God made him Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us. He took our sin upon himself so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So in him we receive Christ's righteousness. This is what we see in Romans 3.22. This righteousness is given to us, given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And here we see the beauty of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that we fall and we continue to fall and we need his grace, we need his work, we need Jesus to step in and that it's through Jesus that we receive his righteousness. It's, it's through Jesus that, that we earn the, the benefits of the covenant. It's through Jesus that we are strengthened by God to continue to follow after him and rely on him. And when we fall and when we fail, because we will, we turn around and receive that grace again, and we receive his forgiveness, and we receive his renewed heart and, and strength to continue to push forward. And all this is because of what Christ has done for us, not because of what we have done. When we turn and trust in Jesus, we receive this new life. Have you turned and trusted in Jesus? Have you turned and trusted in Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you are a disciple of Jesus, are you continually trusting in Jesus every day of your life? In closing, I want to add this one caveat here. If we've placed, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, if, if, if you've received them and you're receiving the benefits of his work on the cross, that does not mean that we sit back and do nothing. That does not mean that we, that we just say, okay, God saved me. We have his righteousness, and now I'm all good, and, and that's it. No, no, we strive. We strive through Jesus to see our hearts grow in commitment to God. We continually ask him to transform our hearts. We continue to, to uh, come to him and confess sin or areas of sin in our life. We allow him to continue to work in us and transform our hearts and ask that our hearts would be responsive to him that we would grow in our commitment of him and we rest in Jesus' work, his grace, as we strive to grow in wholehearted commitment to God. And this, when we do this, when we do this, we finish strong. When we continue to rely on God's grace, when we continue to pursue him and continue to rely on him and strive after that, we finish well. Finishing well is not being perfect. Finishing well is continuing to rely on Christ and his grace. You may have heard this guy named Eric Liddell. He's uh, from that movie Chariots of Fire back before my day, back before all of our days, actually. He was a very fast runner. He ran in the Paris Olympics in 1924, and he went, won the gold medal. He's a Christian. Uh, he was actually supposed to run the 100-meter race, but it was on a Sunday, and in his mind, he was not going to do anything on a Sunday but worship God. So he's like, I'm not running the 100 meter. And so what did they do? They tossed him in the 400 meter race. Now, I, I don't know much about running, but I know enough from my 11, age 11 and 12 race <laughs> that the 100 meter sprint is much different than a 400 meter run. You got something that's called pacing involved. <laughs> So Eric Little goes out to the 400. He, he's, a, he's a sprinter. He's fast. He goes up to the 400, and he wins the gold medal. He wins the gold medal. And afterwards, people come up to him, and, and, and someone asked him, Eric, how did you run? How do you run the 400 so fast? And I love Eric's words. He said this, well, I run the first 200 as fast as I can, and then by God's grace, I run the second 200 even faster. <laughs> I love that. He's relying on God's grace. I'm, I'm going to run as fast as I can, 
And you know what? When it gets tough, I'm going to rely on his grace and keep trying to run as fast as I can some more. I love that response. Regardless of your age, regardless of what your age in this room, we all want to finish well. Whether you're a teenager all the way up to whatever age, we all want to finish well. Would we be reminded, would we recognize the lure to look elsewhere, the, the temptation to rely on so many other things? Would we remember his work in our past, his faithfulness, his goodness to us? Would we realize his eagerness to help us? Would we turn to him and see his eagerness to help us? And we re, would we resolve to grow in our commitment in our hearts towards him? It's ongoing reliance on God's grace that we keep running and that we finish well. Join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we confess that uh, sometimes we don't always rely on you, and I confess that myself too, God. We want to finish well, but so quickly and so easily we look to other things. We look to maybe people around us or our own efforts or things, and Lord, we confess that before you now. Lord, we, we want to have our hearts wholly committed to you. We want to fix our eyes on you. We want to rely on you. Would you help us? Would you work in our hearts? Would you continue to transform us in that way? Would you give us a heart and a desire to do that? And Lord, when we fail, Lord, would we receive your forgiveness? We receive your forgiveness and grace. And would you encourage us and give us the, the, the push to continue to run hard, relying on that same grace? So we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for you, Jesus, and what you did on the cross for us, that we have your righteousness, and through you, we have life and can continue to rely on you as we seek to finish well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, just before, at the beginning of the service, uh, Isaiah and Emma referred to the James passage, and I'm just going to find it here for us. Sorry, I didn't get this earlier. It says this. Let me close with these words. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops or produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. And that's our heart, that we would not gripe and complain when difficulty comes at us, but we would say, Lord, what would you want to do in me through this? I'm going to rely on you, and I'm going to trust in you. And Harbor, that's my encouragement as you go today. Don't look at it as a difficulty as something you need to get rid of. Look at it and say, God, what would you want to do? How would you want to grow me? How would you want to mature me through this so that I grow as a follower of you, so that my heart becomes even more committed to you? And as you go out, as you go out, there are so many people who are far from God. And as you live that out, as you seek to love Jesus, point them to him as well. Point him to his grace. And harbor, we are sent.